Yellowstone National Park is a land of mystery and legend. When people think of Yellowstone, they most often think of its famous geysers and hot springs, its magical mud pots, painted waters, and of course, its range of wildlife. Of all the animals that call Yellowstone their home, one species' existence stands out as more controversial than any other, the wolf. The year was 1906. The United States Congress was starting to receive hundreds of letters from concerned ranchers who made their living raising livestock near Yellowstone Park in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Their concerns all involved wolves harassing and killing their livestock, and the economic impact it was having on their livelihood. Soon, the concerns grew in the area not only to livestock, but the idea that wolves could kill more desirable species like elk and bison. The government concluded they needed to send federally funded trappers into the national park to exterminate the wolves in order to protect other animals. From this decision, the question of wolves' place in the Yellowstone ecosystem has become a huge debate. Should they have even been killed in the first place? Some say they could not have known better with very little research about biodiversity. Others argue that they should have taken more time in researching the park, rather than just choosing their bias. There have been no wolf-related human deaths in the last hundred years. However, 80 wolf-human interaction attacks have been reported in the last 60 years. Of these 80 cases, only 25 were unprovoked. Even then, only 13 resulted in injury. The rest of the 80 cases were almost exclusively wolves acting through self-defense. From 1919 through 1926, 136 wolves were killed by government trappers alone. When the 1940s rolled around, hardly any wolf sightings were reported. And by the 1970s, after an intensive study, biologists confirmed that no wolves lived inside the park. Without that major apex predator, hunting opportunities almost tripled around the park when the elk population exploded. Additionally, an increase in other major herbivores allowed for much easier animal sighting for tourists visiting Yellowstone. But the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began to debate whether profits and tourism were more important than the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In 1987, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposed that wolves be reintroduced to Yellowstone as an experimental species. We also had the Endangered Species Act come about as law in 1973 that says we cannot wipe some species off the face of the planet. And wolves are very much under that umbrella too. So the best answer as to why wolves were restored to Yellowstone is it makes it a natural system. It was the law, but finally people wanted it. From 1994 to 1995, wolves were taken out of Jasper National Park in Alberta, Canada. The biologists capturing the wolves made sure that the wolves being taken were in family groups that primarily fed on elk and bison, the primary food source in Yellowstone. The first wolves were a group of eight captured and penned on January 12, 1995. By the end of January, a total of 31 wolves were gathered and made ready for the move. From March 21st through the 31st of 1995, all of the wolves were released into different sections of the park. Later in April of 1996, an additional 17 wolves were released. The last group of 17 were not penned prior to release, like the others had been. This proved to be a problem because their intense homing instinct made them hightail at north without a second thought. Fortunately, the wolves that were penned stayed in the park. From 1996 to 2000, the Wolf Reintroduction Project was running smoothly and being supported by Wyoming courts. Those still debating the benefits of the reintroduction by filing court cases against were being shut down. However, in January of 2000, it was discovered that Wolf Reintroduction violated a section of the Endangered Species Act of 1972, which states, an experimental population that has been authorized for release is wholly separate geographically from non-experimental populations of the same species. Because nearby wolves in Montana had no geological barrier to stop them from going into Yellowstone, this violated the idea that newly released wolves were separated from native wolves. This court case brought the reintroduction project to a halt stating the researchers can no longer study the wolves and their impact on the park. The Wolf Project appealed and the judge ruled the wolves should be recaptured and moved back to Canada, but specifically stated they should not be killed. 
the researchers with Wolf reintroduction quickly pushed back by filing for gray wolves to be delisted as an endangered species, thus making the violation of the act no longer an issue. This changed the judge's ruling as he sided with the Wolf Reintroduction Project, allowing them to continue their work. This ruling led those in opposition on this debate to shift their focus once again to protecting other more desirable wildlife and livestock from the predator. However, when the gray wolf was removed from the endangered species list, Wyoming passed a law allowing people outside Yellowstone to hunt and kill wolves as they please, provided that they report the wolf kills to the Game and Fish Department. I listened to all the arguments on one side, on the other. As a hunter, I thought, you know, we can handle this. As long as the agreement's followed, this isn't the end of the end of the world. The reintroduction of wolves has had incredibly positive effects on Yellowstone in more ways than researchers could have ever imagined. Wolf reintroduction has directly impacted biodiversity in the park, strengthening the arguments in favor of bringing wolves back. However, it is not without controversy. One of the first effects seen across the park was a significant decrease in elk population, which dropped tremendously from 30,000 to 6,000. At first glance, this may seem really bad, but plant life in the summer and winter feeding grounds of the park can only support 7,000 total elk. Initially, the wolves killing thousands of elk supported the debate against reintroduction, because people thought they wouldn't stop, but it actually led to so many other areas of improved biodiversity across the entire park. Fewer elk brings about that ecosystem balance, that biodiversity that the Park Service seeks as natural. And that's a very important goal for the Park Service. One of the most fascinating scientific finds was how the wolves changed the behavior of Yellowstone's rivers. Researchers discovered widespread trophic cascade or an ecological process that affects an entire food web. Everyone knows the wolves killed animals, but they gave life to many others. With wolves gone for 70 years, the elk population built up, bringing plant life to an all-time low. However, when the wolves arrived, even though they were few in numbers, they made a remarkable impact. In addition to thinning the elk herd, they actually changed the behavior of the elk. The elk started avoiding certain parts of the park, specifically the places they could be trapped, like valleys and riverbanks. With no elk eating the vegetation in these areas, it was able to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees almost quintupled in just six years. Bare mountainsides quickly became forests of aspen, willow, and cottonwood. With the increase in vegetation, especially trees, the number of birds increased. Songbirds and migratory birds returned to the region. Water animals like beavers, muskrats, ducks, fish, amphibians, and reptiles also increased their populations greatly. The wolves killed coyotes, which in turn allowed rabbits, foxes, and weasels to return to the park. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on carcasses left by wolves. Bear numbers also increased, with more berries growing on the regenerated shrubs. The wolves scared elk out of the river bottoms, allowing the Yellowstone beaver population to return. Beaver dams further slowed the rivers, creating better habitat for other water animals in and around the rivers. Some still debate whether or not the wolves actually changed the behavior of the rivers, but the impact the wolves made throughout the park made the rivers meander less, and there was less erosion. The channels narrowed, and more pools and ripple sections formed. The regenerating trees and shrubs absorbed the water, enough to bring the water table up and the rivers to the original level. So really the simplest way to look at it is all the parts of the system now are in place, and they're interacting differently. And I hesitate to use a value judgment laden word, but it, it's healthier this way than we had certain parts of the system before that were absent. So all those things functioning together has made nature look like it used to before we started managing it. And those management intentions were, were good. We just didn't know enough about it. And so we have this makeover in Yellowstone now. We've brought carnivores back, wolves being the most high profile, and it's changed the way Yellowstone looks. While controversial, this evolution is scientifically proven and a big part of the diplomacy that goes into allowing the wolves to remain inside the park. Whether you agree with wolf reintroduction or not, one thing is clear, their place in the greater ecosystem is critical to the overall balance in Yellowstone National Park.
Lachlan, that was a wonderful documentary. I'm going to take a wild guess at being from Lander, Wyoming. You've been to Yellowstone Park? Oh, yes. I've been there since I was three, probably been there like 15 times. I remember the first time I like saw Old Faithful go out. I just remember like feeling something in me and I was like, this is an incredible place. Yeah, you're lucky to live that close to it. It is a wonderful, wonderful place. This was an incredibly interesting story. Uh, did you know much about wolf repatriation before you, you know, started this documentary? How did how did you come to this topic? Well, so I have connections in Yellowstone from being there 15 times, and we found this, we found these people who would just track the wolves in the park all day long. And so we started hanging around with them because wolves were pretty difficult to see in Yellowstone. And I started just slowly getting exposed to more and more of it. And I started getting so much more fascinated in wolves. And then I figured out that they weren't in the park for a while. And I, I just thought, That'd be a great history day topic. So did you lock into this topic pretty early on or were there other ones that you were thinking about? I had a different topic in mind at first. I was trying to figure out if they had actually moved Native Americans off of the off of Yellowstone National Park's land before um, before its creation or while it was being created. But I could, I found one article on it, basically one paragraph on it, and I looked and looked and looked, but it was, I just couldn't find anything on it. And so then I just thought wolves, I love wolves and like animals, and it just clicked right there. So, so tell me a little bit about your research process. I mean, this is, this is a topic that is not without controversy, as your documentary points out. So I'm just sort of curious, where were the primary resources uh, that you uh, that you got and you used, uh, and uh, and how you decided to to structure this story? So I kind of started out by getting a basic overview of what happened, and then I started diving deeper and contacted the volunteers in Yellowstone who followed the wolves around. And they connected to me to a man named Rick McIntyre, whose interview proved to be so good. It just gave me so much more insight into what it was actually like being there, like transporting the wolves. And although, unfortunately, I could not use that footage because it was too windy, it was just a great interview, and I used so much from it. So did you, uh, I mean, but you have, you've got a lot of footage uh, in your documentary of the wolves. Where, where did you find, because, you know, you, in a documentary, obviously, you got to have images. So where did you find those images? And then how did you decide to structure this story? Did you write a script first and then match images to it or vice versa or a little bit of both? Sorry, that's a that's a big question. Yeah, well, a lot of the interview or not interviews, um, a lot of the footage of the wolves that you saw that could be found through like news websites, but I kind of matched it up with my script because I had a script. It definitely had to be tweaked a lot while while actually narrating my documentary, but I kind of brought together and compiled a ton of pictures. And then during some time at my home, I just started picking through each picture and each phrase in my documentary. Did you find that it was difficult to stay in the 10 minute time limit? Was your story bigger than that? Oh, yes, that was definitely difficult to do. There was so much there that it was almost impossible to fit everything into 10 minutes. I could have gone 30, maybe even an hour if I wanted to. 
So you do, I think, a, a good job of trying to present a lot of different sides of the issue. I mean, you can understand why there were people who were upset that the wolves were, you know, hunted into a zero population in Yellowstone, and then people who are upset when Yellowstone is repopulated with with wolves. But how did you find, you know, as you're putting this documentary together where, you know, your sentiments were were going? Oh, that's a tricky question. My grandpa or all of my grandparents, they kind of lived through that time period. So they were definitely more on the side of um, wolves should not be there. And they were taken out for a reason. And so I got insight into that. And then I live in Wyoming. So there are plenty of ranchers I know, especially up in the around, around the Cody area and saw it like that side of things. But then I filtered through what the people who followed the wolves said and their opinions. And it kind of balanced out evenly in the documentary. And it was just, the balance was just perfect. I found your interview with Doug Smith of the Wolf, you know, re repopulation project to be particularly interesting. How did you find him? Well, again, I have many contacts in Yellowstone. And it was actually after Rick McIntyre, he talked about Doug Smith. I mean, I had heard of Doug Smith, but I didn't realize how crucial he was in the wolf reintroduction and repopulation and keeping the wolves there. So was there anything that was like really surprising that you learned through your research? Well, I hadn't been exposed to as much of the rancher's point of view. I mean, I had heard it, but it was mainly going to the park with the um, wolf volunteers. And I realized how painful it was for them to watch like wolves come back in and threaten their livelihood in general. And that was super surprising because I would have never expected them to be this up in arms. But when I like started researching that side more, it was just incredible. Um, Lachlan, the last question for you, are wolves bloodthirsty menaces or are they stewards of the land? You know, <laughs> that's a great question. But in my opinion, they're stewards of the land. Because as personally watching like elk and wolves just in general, they're beautiful creature, creatures. And I would never want to see elk die of disease. And then these wolves just be slowly closed into smaller spaces. And I think they really increase biodiversity. Your documentary makes a very compelling case for that. And I congratulate you for it and for your award. Lachlan, thank you so much. Thank you.